watching us chat rubbish. <laughs> uh, cool. So I'm going to talk about my sort of um, bugbear and hopefully solution to a problem that I think is quite important. Uh, and the problem is, is really this. Um, if you imagine your mean pressure from the moment that you uh, walk, your patient walks into the anaesthetic, because these patients blood pressure, not your blood pressure, that patient walks into the anaesthetic room, gets a bit nervous and it goes up a bit, and then they have to slug a propofol and the pressure's in their boots. And then that kind of redistributes. And then you transfer them, if such a thing exists, from the anaesthetic room to theatre, you don't have any monitoring for a bit. And then you come back and now there's zero stimulus and they're flat as a pancake with too much seed fluorine because you wanted to get the concentrations up quickly, but still got a bit of propofol. And then the surgeons start and then you sort of reach a plateau and hopefully nothing goes on in here. And, and all the time, this is when your non-invasive blood pressure machine is going up and down. And you can see that it, it's quite possible that you never knew that the blood pressure was actually 10 millimetres of mercury lower than you thought it was. Because all you've got is a measurement here and a measurement here, and then you've got nothing here whilst your monitor's disconnected and so on and so forth. And then you, you put it on and it's not tight enough and it misses a reading. You can see there's, there's potential for five, six, seven minutes without any blood pressure readings. And during that time, people get hypotensive invariably. And we know from a recent enormous meta-analysis of 42 studies that vary from having about 2,000 to 500,000 patients in each, all retrospective, that cumulative time spent with a blood pressure below, a MAP pressure below 70, below 60 and below 55 give cumulative increases in risk developing post-operative mortality, AKI, myocardial injury and delirium. Um, what we don't know is whether if you stop that happening, all of those problems will go away, or the hypotension that you see is just a surrogate marker for these being crappy patients. But there is some work now, there's a big trial, a relatively large trial, RCT in France by Foutier and colleagues in high-risk patients who mandated a very tight blood pressure control and they found their primary outcome, which was organ dysfunction uh, plus AKI, was reduced by keeping these people with a, a very tightly controlled blood pressure with a, an algorithm. And there's lots of studies going on looking at that now. But we only really use two different ways of measuring your blood pressure at the moment. You've got the Dynamap integrated into the anaesthetic machines, or you've got an art line. And if you're going to prevent hypotension, you kind of need to know that it's happened. So uh, I'm sorry, maybe so, yeah, you've seen some of this before, um, but we did a survey across five, five hospitals in the West Midlands to see what makes people decide whether they're going to accept the missing data of an of a invasive uh, monitor or put an art line in and when they're going to put the art line in if they do. So we asked people first when they expect to see the most hemodynamic instability, and unsurprisingly, the vast majority said it was during induction, and the people who didn't say it was during induction said it was between induction and surgeon starting. So all of the hemodynamic instability is very front-loaded. And we then asked them when they put the arterial line in. Now, most, almost everybody said, well, it depends on the situation, and that's entirely reasonable. But we then asked, what, how often do you reckon you do put it in? when the patient's still awake before induction, before all this hemodynamic stability we're talking about happens. And people reckon only about a third of the time they do that. Now, very, we asked people why they were putting them in, and very few of them were put in just because they wanted frequent arterial blood sampling. And the vast majority was because of hemodynamic instability. So if, you're, if you think that hemodynamic instability is at the start, and you're putting in an art line to pick it up, you need to put in the art line before the hemodynamic instability happens. And what this shows is that even though people think that's what's going to happen, their actions don't follow that. And these are the sort of reasons that we're given. It's more painful, it's more difficult. Um, I've never had an art line, so I don't know, but it strikes me that there's some decent local anesthetic in an ultrasound machine can make it a pretty painless, painless procedure. 
But I don't pretend that I'm going to be able to convince everybody in the world to change and start putting arterial lines in a way. So there is an alternative, and that is continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, um, which I, I didn't realise actually seems to come up all the time in the FRCA primary. They constantly ask about it, but it involves the PNAS principle, which is that if you put a cuff on your finger and inflate it such, use a, a photo graph, you can inflate the cuff in order to um, stop blood flow. And at the point you stop blood flow, that's what blood pressure is. And you can do that on, you know, several times a second constantly and produce yourself a, a continuous blood pressure curve. It is not equivalent to an art line. It, it doesn't react as quickly. It's about 10, between 10 and 15 seconds behind the curve versus an art line. But it's a lot less than three minutes behind the curve, which is what you're getting at best with a with a um, an intermittent non-invasive monitor. So it's it's more responsive than intermittent monitoring, less responsive than an arterial line. And what we found, if if you look at papers out there that are put on these monitors, but not let the anaesthetists see what's on them, they pick up almost twice as many hypotensive episodes than the anaesthetists are aware of. This was in, in a paper in C sections, and they, they found, as you can see, 376 episodes, only 208 of them were known about by the person treating the patient. So there's lots of missed hypertension. Someone's done this, uh, done a study where they put these on patients in ED research and monitored them remotely and compared them to what the treating clinicians could see. And they found that several patients had maps of less than 50 for half an hour that was never noted by the ED recess people. So the, they pick up hypotension that we don't otherwise know about. So then we, well, I hypothesized that if we put these monitors on, hypotension will be seen more frequently, and so people's behavior will change. And I would like to test that in a clinical trial, but the first thing you have to do in a clinical trial is look at whether someone's already done it. Um, so I've done a systematic review based on this PK question. So, so P, the population is adults having non-cardiac surgery. The intervention is CNAP, which is a brand of um, continuous monitoring. It is the one that's got the most literature behind it, but it's not the only one. So we, we actually looked at any kind of continuous monitoring. Um, the, the comparator, the standard is all patients that don't have an arterial line. So standard non-invasive intermittent blood pressure. And the outcome, we're not sure what outcomes we should use, so we considered any outcome intra or post-operatively. Um, we registered it with Prospero, which is a prospective um, register of all systematic reviews to make sure that you're not doing something that somebody else is doing, and you pre-specify how you're going to go about analysing so you reduce the amount of bias. Uh, and this is, this is my register, if you want to go and check. Uh, and this is, this is a PRISMA diagram, which is basically what I found and, and how I narrowed it down to the papers. So, so we, we got um, 2,344 papers that um, met our search criteria after we deleted all the duplicates. Uh, having screened the abstracts for all of these, uh, we narrowed it down to just six papers that had continuous monitoring as an intervention and reported an intra or post-operative outcome. Um, this wasn't suitable for a meta-analysis, it's far too small and too heterogeneous. So there's no quantitative synthesis, there's just the narrative synthesis, which is basically me telling you what the paper showed. So there were six of them. The, this one was, I have no idea how it got published by anyone. It's in something called the Middle Eastern Journal of Anesthesia. And I think they must have been mates with the editor because it's complete rubbish bias stuff uh, that doesn't report a primary outcome, doesn't say in advance what they're going to do and doesn't really say who did and didn't receive the intervention. So I haven't included any information from them, even though it would be generally supportive of our ideas. So, so the three papers, and this is where most of the literature lies, this, are in um, elective orthopedic patients. Uh, so these all took between eight, well, 40, 80, and 160 patients undergoing planned arthroplasty, and found that intraoperatively, if you start on the right, the lowest point in blood pressure after induction was higher if you had continuous monitoring 
connected and visible to the anaesthetist versus connected and not visible to the anaesthetist. Moving across, the, if you take the hemodynamic time throughout the entire operation, if you had the monitor connected, you had more hemodynamically stable time than those who didn't have it connected. And that was defined as having a map within 20% of your starting point. And then after the operation, there was reduced rates of postoperative organ dysfunction if you had the monitor attached. And that was linked back to the fact that you were given more vasopressors during the operation. Um, they define organ dysfunction as post-op AKI, myocardial infarctions, and surgical site infections. Less well studied, well, both of these papers looked at elective C-sections. As I said, this one is no good at all. This one had three groups, actually. They had a, a blood pressure targeted group, a cardiac output targeted group, which I've not included, and the, the control non-invasive group. Um, and they found that the, the absolute lowest blood pressure through the C-section was higher, again, if you had the monitor attached compared to a group with the monitor attached but not visible. Um, and they spent less time throughout the whole procedure hypotensive. And these guys looked at people who were, had thorough surgery in the upright position because they were concerned that they need more accurate blood pressure monitoring because blood's got to go uphill to their brain um, as well as um, deal with anaesthetics. Uh, so, so they aim for a blood pressure of over 80% of the baseline and found that having the monitor reduced the amount of time they spent below that. So it's, it's a, it gets boring by the paper, really. It's a fairly consistent message that having everything so far has been single center studies with a small number of patients that have shown that having the monitor attached makes the anaesthetist treat you in a more hemodynamically stable fashion. Which gets around the thing I said at the start, which is that people expect hypotension to start the operations, but don't put in a monitor to do something about it. So this is um, roughly how my clinical trial is sort of shaping up at the moment. And the reason I quite like to present it to people is that I want to get your feedback on how this might actually run in practice, because this will be probably the first site it's run in. Um, so the population will be ASA two to four patients having surgery under GA or regional in whom you're not going to put an arterial line and who are in sinus rhythm because the monitor requires you to have the normal rhythm. The intervention will be continuous monitor blood pressure monitoring using CNAP rather than any other competitors. CNAP is better because number one, it's got more literature behind it. Number two, it has two cuts rather than one, only one measures, whilst the other one sits dormant and every half an hour it switches. People worry about digital ischemia and they've done that to essentially get around it. The comparison will be standard care, but with the monitor attached and not visible. Um, and the outcomes are going to be mostly intraoperative outcomes because to get any reasonable power on post-operative outcomes like API and I and stuff, I'd need to recruit about 5,000 patients. And for CT2, well, that's not possible. Um, so so the, it will, the, the main outcome will be time spent with, a, it's going to be a mean arterial pressure because that's where the biggest body of evidence is. Um, below thresholds and those thresholds will be 70, 60 and 55 because they are the ones that are most frequently reported and it makes us comparable with what's out there. I'm also interested in how much induction drug is given, how much, how, how deep people are, how much beta pressure they get, and, and also I'd like to know what, how often these things happen, but I, you know, it's gonna be a relatively low amount. We've recently decided to move away from doing a randomized control trial to doing a before and after trial. Um, and the reason for that is I wanted to do a randomized trial because that's the gold standard. However, several people have criticized the design saying that if you have an anesthetist who's doing this, let's say 10 times, and they're randomized each time, the first time they are randomized to be able to see the monitor, they find out that their patient was way more hypotensive than they thought. Even the next time they get a randomized patient without the monitor, their behavior is likely to have changed. 
and that would complicate the results significantly. It would reduce our ability to detect the difference uh, between the two groups. So we think that's we're going to try that design rather than a, a randomized design. But it's not without difficulties. And we're one of the biggest concerns we have is that we'll get a big Hawthorne effect, which will be, I'll tell you that we're interested in hypotension and we're trying to monitor to see if it changes things. It's going to change the practice. The German group got through ethics um, to lie to the anesthetists and tell them the purpose of the study was to evaluate the monitor, whereas actually they were evaluating the anesthetist. Um, our PPI group say that that is probably not acceptable. Um, although, you know, very <coughs> logical in its approach, and they feel, and I agree, that it would break down the trust between researchers and and and, and um, But anyway, so so, tell me what whether you think it's a worthwhile thing to do, and where you think in trying to run that the problems will arise. Or don't. Um, can I just ask why are you excluding yeah. SA1 patients? Surely that would be a good control to how to fit in healthy patients. Um, simply because their, their event rate for the, the bad things that happen afterwards is very low. They'll generally be day cases that go home same day. And so even if they do get myocardial injury or AKI, we won't ever know about it. Um, and they are less susceptible to the big hemodynamic swings. So the, their propensity to benefit from it, we felt was lower than the higher risk patients. It essentially allows us to use a smaller number of patients because the patients we look at are a bit more enriched. Um, I should say that, that we, we have to do a feasibility study to prove that we can actually recruit to it and we, our first group is going to be fractured not patients. That's partly because I think my boss is Joyce, who's just finished running regard study, and so it's very set up for hip fractures. But they are a, they're a sensible group. They have hemodynamic swings all over the place, but people don't put arterial lines in all that often. Um, so providing they don't have AF, which I realise significant <laughs> number of them will, um, I think it represents a group that has a huge propensity for benefit from better hemodynamic control. I think it's an interesting group. I mean, I trying to do vascular and yeah, put heart lines in perfectly, and that's straightforward. But I completely agree. I know there's a bunch of negative things, there's more than that. Probably won't be putting heart lines in form, but yeah. it'd be really interesting to know. Yeah. Um, and they've got a much, much higher rate of all of the nasty things that happen yeah. after, after an hour second. And then, um, just out of interest, are there any comparatives that is actually a regressive blood pressure management improves outcome? So, if you use things like mesoranal fusions or basic press inotropes, does that improve outcomes? There's, there's, there's one good RCT that's actually published at the moment, um, which is the FUTA paper, the IMPRESS trial, uh, which was seven French, uh, seven French university hospitals. Loads of criticisms of the paper, though. It, they took a really narrow, high risk, very enriched group. And although they successfully managed to keep blood pressure in those um, within that channel um, compared to their control group, their, their outcomes were so. Um, they're, they're not real world outcomes. It was like a composite outcome of a series of definitions of organ dysfunction plus proven AKI. It, it wasn't good enough to say, yeah, I'll hang my hat on that. We should definitely aggressively treat it. There is a trial running out of Nottingham at the moment called the Hip Hop Trial, um, which we'll probably end up recruiting for, which is um, does tight blood pressure control in hip fracture improve post operative outcomes? Um, and that will, one, compete with my trial, uh, but two, answer your question to some extent. But that, that's any, oh, hello. Hello. Is there any control on the frequency of non-invasive blood pressure measurements? Because you may have staff, you may have anaesthetists who routinely change the interval to one minute uh, intervals or may give anticipatory metaraminal, um, anticipating a drop of hypertension to, to uh, 
uh, to minimise the impact of that? Uh, yeah, I, we won't put any controls on how often people do it. All we'll say is that if you don't do it for more than 10 minutes, then the patient drops out of the trial because we think that's a long way outside normal practice. But no, we will put no limit on how often they can do it. But what we will do is record the exact timing of all of the boluses of vasopressors. So we'll be able to describe okay. whether that happens or not. Because I certainly think it does in some cases. Cool. Thank you very much. Good. Appreciate it.